Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, session um, on uh, um, the carbon market, uh, energy market decarbonization and energy transition. A very warm uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, it is uh, six presentations for uh, one and a half hour. Um, that allocates about 15 minutes per presentation. Uh, so I would like to ask you for trying to keep the presentation in time. Obviously, I will I'll, I will let you know when you have another five minutes. Uh, if we keep in time, we will have time for discussion. Uh, two, uh, I will uh, I will be the chair in this session. My name is Yordanis Kalajdzovna. I'm a professor in finance and energy economics in Etodensia Business School. Uh, my uh, and uh, I think that we can start. The first presentation will be uh, is climate uh, policy effective in reducing. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, southwest versus uh, southeast versus southwest Europe, uh, and the presenter is Ines, if I'm not mistaken. So can I pass yeah. the stage Hello. on to you? Mm -hmm. Hello. So I will Hello. start the presentation right away. Okay. Uh, so this work analyzes the effects that climate policy have on greenhouse gas emissions. It is focused on this notion of a green paradox, which I will explain very briefly. And it's focused on uh, European countries, especially two groups, Southwest countries and Southeast countries. So let me change. So this is the outline for the presentation. And now the introduction regarding the green paradox. A green paradox, of course, when climate policies that are created to reduce carbon emissions end up backfire and have undesirable effects. So they end up increasing emissions. Why does this happen? Well, this happens because fossil fuels are exhaustible, non-renewable resources, and their prices reflect their scarcity. So what happens is fossil fuels producers if they anticipate that uh, it will have a more environmental policy stringency or any other substitute fuel will have lower prices, either because of uh, subsidies or because technological innovation, they anticipate that and they start producing more today to enjoy more profits. So instead of distributing, distributing their um, extraction of the resources towards time, they uh, extract more today, they end up increasing greenhouse gas emissions, which of course has a negative effect. Uh, so because of this, our paper has two research questions. First, we want to know if climate policy and by climate policy, we use feeding tariffs and participation in the UETS sorry, will lead to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we want to see if a green paradox exists or not. Uh, we have a secondary research question, which is if green, uh, green innovation, how it affects also greenhouse gas emissions, because a green paradox can arise both from policies, from climate policies, or it can also arise from technological breakthroughs. What we will see in our results is that feed-in tariffs do cause a green paradox, paradox so they end up increasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, whereas green innovation are actually effective and the, the acceleration of patent development ends up decelerating emissions. In terms of policy mechanisms, we are focused in these two policy mechanisms, so feed-in tariffs and participation in the UETS. I will be very briefly here. So feed-in tariffs are an effective and cost-efficient policy instrument to promote electricity generation and to increase the capacity of renewables for countries. The tariffs act as an incentive that compensates the higher costs of implementation when compared with the already implemented conventional fossil fuels. Uh, the UETS is uh, the largest and most liquid emission trading market. It involves all 28 European Union countries and it covers several emission intensive sectors and activities. And its objective is to achieve abatement by encouraging companies to innovate and to be more efficient. In the end, what we expect to see is as carbon price increases, polluters will uh, decrease their emissions. 
In terms of our empirical methodology, uh, we use the ordinary least square panel model with fixed effects. The data spans 25 years, so from 1993 to 2017. Uh, we did perform uh, unit root tests, which reveal that all our variables are integrated or first order, except for the feeding tariff, which are stationary at levels. So as you can see in the equation, all our variables are in first differences, expected, except the feed, feed-in tariffs. We have four uh, different panel configurations. So we have the main panel that represents Europe, and it has these 23 countries. Then we have a southern uh, panel with eight countries. And then we separate this panel into two smaller panels. So we have the southwest panel and the southeast panel. Uh, our variables, we use total emissions of greenhouse gases as the dependent variable. We use patents from environmental related technologies as a proxy for green innovation and as a proxy for technological breakthrough. We use energy consumption as a proxy for electricity generation, electricity demand, and in some sense, economic activity. And final, uh, finally, our policy variables, which are the mean value of feeding tariffs for these technologies and participation in the UETS, which we use as a dummy that is active after 2005, which is the year when the, the UETS started. And so here we have our main results. What we see is that feed-in tariffs may cause a green paradox because we see that the beta coefficients are positive, meaning that as the mean value of the feed-in tariffs increases, it is expected that the greenhouse gas emissions will also increase. And we see this for the four panels. On the other side, the dummy of the ETS seems to have a negative effect. So, but it's only significant for one of the panels. So this dummy is only significant for the southern countries. Still, it is a, a good result because it, it shows a negative uh, um, relationship. So participating in the UETS seems to decre decrease the greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, regarding the patents, we see a negative relationship, meaning that accelerating the development of patents, so more accelerating green innovation, will lead to a deceleration of greenhouse gas emissions. So there is no, no any type of green paradox here. And as expected, we see a positive relationship between energy consumption and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, we see that this is the stronger relationship as the beta coefficients have the higher values. In terms of the panels, we also see that the, the first three panels, so Europe, Southern countries and Southwest countries, are very similar in terms of their results, except, of course, for the dummy of the ETS. And we see that the, the panel with the four countries, the four Southeast countries, um, it, it lacks significance in most of the variables. In fact, what we see is that only energy consumption is significant. Um, it should be also noted that when we compare values between this group of countries and the other groups, for instance, comparing Southeast countries with South -est, Southwest countries, the values are very different. So for instance, where it, um, the average of environmental related patents is around 200, for Southwest countries, it is five for Southeast countries. And by the same token, whereas um, feeding tariffs have average value of two euros in Southwest countries, it has an average value of 38 cents over these 25 years and for the countries in Southeast panels. So this may also explain why these variables seem to not affect significantly uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So now regarding the conclusions, uh, we see that an increase, an increase in renewable subsidies, so an increase in feed-in feed tariffs, seem to increase uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So the paper provides some evidence that a green paradox may exist in Europe. Uh, an important policy implication of this work is that an increase in these incentives 
regarding renewables should be cautiously paired up with anti-fossil fuels policy. We know that feed-in tariffs are important. They are important for increased generation capacity of renewables and to the deployment to uh, decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. So our recommendation is not towards the feed-in tariffs by themselves, but it is towards anti-fossil fuel policies because how much uh, fossil fuels producers have an incentive to keep their carbon underground, um, it will affect uh, the conduct to climate change. And also, if there exists a green paradox, it means that when they anticipate these kind of subsidies, they start to extract more uh, fossil fuels, and of course, which has a negative impact on the environment. Uh, we also see that participating in the UETS seems to uh, have a negative effect on emissions, although it's only significant for one of the um, one of the panels. Uh, energy demand arises as the main propeller of emissions, as we've seen, and environmental related uh, innovation has a negative effect on greenhouse gas emissions. Regarding the panels, we see that the, south, the southern and south southwest countries have similar results to the whole European panel, while the southeast panel stands out for its lack, lack of significance in the main variables. As we have seen, only energy consumption seems to have an impact on emissions. So finally, um, this is still a work in progress, so any kind of suggestions and feedback will be very appreciated. Uh, we want to develop case studies, so to study individual countries, because we we want to know which countries, in fact, have a green paradox and which do not have, or if all countries have a green paradox. We want to compare the panel of the South countries with North or and or with Central countries. And we also would like to test other policy variables besides feeding tariffs and uh, participation in the UETS. So this is it. Thank you. I hope it was in time. So that, that leaves us a couple of minutes uh, that uh, we have some uh, discussion. If there are people who want to ask something, please go forward, um, come forward. Uh, I would like to ask something. First of all, mm -hmm. the, um, why do you think that you find uh, the existence of that paradox? And uh, a, a bit of, if you can direct your uh, response to a more econometric uh, approach, I, I noticed that all the indices are negative. That means that uh, mm -hmm. the long-term average is a, a reduction in greenhouse gases, which uh, is not that evident in many places in Europe. So I find, first of all, that bizarre. And I was thinking while you were presenting that probably uh, these tariffs might actually, I don't know, somehow have an endogeneity effect to one of your variables, mm -hmm. which... Uh, in this version of the paper, you do not investigate, but might be some, I don't know, I'm speculating that some of the consumption, for example, might be endogenously related to the tariffs. So, yes, so maybe one, yes, uh, let me start by that. One of the maybe next steps, it would be also to analyze a model with endo endogenic ingenuity <laughs> concerns, because maybe feeding tariffs, for instance, are related with uh, energy consumption, as you said, but also maybe with innovation in these same energy related technologies. So one of the takes might be that. We also have the problem that feeding tariffs, um, even though we have 25 years of the model, they start to appear later in the model and they are not present in every country and they sometimes we have years that they are zero so uh, they are the, the the policy variables that we have but they still have this kind of problems from an econometric point of view we do see that uh, we use this mean value and using the oil yes what happens is that it has a negative relationship the beta is negative so it seems that when we decrease when sorry when we are increasing the average value of the feed-in tariffs this has a positive effect on emissions. So it seems that it causes greenhouse gas emissions to also increase. But that might raise an issue of optimality that you might want to consider in the future. What is the optimal level of tariffs? Yeah. And that's okay. probably another paper altogether. But uh, <laughs> any other comments yeah. that? Uh, 
Oh. And just one, uh, one extra commentary. We know that feed-in tariffs are important and we are not saying that they are bad because they seem to increase emissions. So the idea is that to see how do fossil fuels uh, react to this side of the market because this is the renewable side of the market but the fossil fuel producers are reacting and are making their decisions based on this renewables market. Good, excellent, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's the first, uh, that was the first presentation. We are exactly on time, 15 minutes. So I believe that it is time that we move forward to the next one. Uh, capacity mechanisms in the decarbonization era, the EU law challenges for Southeast European electricity markets in transition. Well, presenter is Orestes on run. So shall I pass the stage on to you? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Rodani. I appreciate Welcome. that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I, I won't have a presentation. I'll try to be brief and discuss the paper uh, that we co-drafted with my associate uh, Stella Mavromati. Uh, a few things about myself. I'm a partner at DLA Piper in Brussels, and we work a lot on, on EU energy regulatory matters. Uh, and that's pretty much the source uh, of knowledge and of experience of our paper. So. Um, I'll start with uh, maybe giving you a peek of the, a bit of the back of the factual background. Uh, sorry for interrupting yeah, a bit. Sure. Uh, do you have any slides to show? You no, I don't. No, no, I ah, don't okay. have. Please we don't have any slides. It's going to be just an oral presentation for for ten mm -hmm. minutes or so. So hopefully it is interesting. If not, uh, yeah, we'll we'll see how that's going to play out. So um, yeah, so let me start with uh, giving you a bit of the of the factual background. Uh, of, of of the question around around our paper, obviously uh, the the uh, the EU regulatory framework has been going through gradual changes the past the past decade or so, um, and the most important uh, development that this regulatory the new regulatory framework has to has to deal with is the is the aggressive decarbonization targets that the EU um, has set, uh, wishing to become sort of the the world's first carbon neutral bloc. Um, that's 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 one thing. Another thing that we do have in southeastern Europe is some some unique, I would say, features of the of the electricity markets that have to be dealt with within that sort of decarbonization um, uh, era and decarbonization strategy of the EU Commission. Therefore, any 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 sort of capacity mechanisms to accommodate these these unique features do in fact um, do in fact. Um, um, have to be have to be accommodated um, and have to be dealt with in this new framework. So I guess the paper that, that we drafted um, has a couple of, of, of basic prongs. The first prong would be um, to provide a sort of an overview of the of the capacity mechanisms um, right now in Europe. We use case studies. We basically define capacity mechanisms uh, going through uh, different features that each such mechanism may. Uh, may demonstrate while while actually using case studies uh, on a jurisdictional basis uh, to demonstrate how specific member states have dealt with those with those capacity mechanisms. Uh, the second the second prong of the paper is actually um, what are the challenges? What are the um, what are the challenges that we have to face given the recent environmental developments in the EU and how basically we can walk this thin line and we can strike a balance between the particularities the southeastern uh, European electricity markets and the and the and the um, environmental uh, environmental uh, and those environmental driven development. Um, I guess the key takeaway of the paper um, is basically um, that 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 capacity mechanisms do indeed play a role in the energy transition, a very important role. Um, they are not they are not a tool of the past, as some some scholarship may be suggesting. However. Um, However, uh, such capacity mechanisms need 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 to uh, operate and need to uh, to be customized to accommodate the the uh, the, the policy uh, and the regulatory um, priorities of the of the EU. Uh, so so going a little bit more into the specifics in terms of types of capacity mechanisms, we obviously have the strategic reserves. Uh, this is um, basically a mechanism which provide the plants that have signaled. That they will be closing down, they are actually be, they are actually put on reserve uh, instead of being activated all the time, and we only use them when there is insufficient network capacity. Uh, they are reimbursed for the cost of the operation of this ad hoc operation, 
Um, and this is rather a very a simple system that that many jurisdictions around the EU have been put have put in place. Um, then you've got the interruptibility themes. Uh, this is basically an incentive based theme uh, that applies to large sized customers, consumers, but can be ordered by the by the TSO to either reduce basically shut off their demand when when the total system capacity has been reached. The, and the total system demand, excuse me, has been reached. And in that, in this regard, they've been providing with inset, incentives such as cash payments. The third capacity mechanism is the uh, the tenders for the new capacity, and the and these are basically tenders to attract investment um, for the construction of new capacity. Pretty much bidding procedures. Last but not least, you've got the, car, the, the targeted capacity payments. Um, these are administrative payments that are made to a subset of capacity in the market facilitate their operation and enhance uh, the capabilities of the market. Uh, going now to the case by case study that we actually uh, put forward in our in our in our paper, uh, I guess we would start with the Creek interruptibility scene that was very recently um, very, very recently um, um, uh, renewed by the European Commission actually two days ago days ago it's September 29, 2020. And, and that commission decision is, is yet to be published. Still, this is a sign of trust by the European Commission to the, to the Greek interruptibility scene that has been uh, extended. Um, basically, uh, the, the way it works is that the TSO contracts charge energy um, consumers to be available to reduce their consumption uh, at times that the system is stressed. Um, and this is also referred to as demand response. Uh, we've got a ministerial decision in Greece, July 2020. It was a uh, very recent ministerial decision that has actually uh, determining the particulars of this of this mechanism. The second jurisdiction that we looked at is the Belgium. We had the Belgian so-called strategic reserve. Uh, it's a measure to produce a uh, strategic reserve from the winter of 2017-2019 and onwards and up to 21-22. Uh, there are five delivery periods, therefore. Uh, basically, this is a covering this basically covers the cost of strategic reserve um, through a tariff levy um, and the volume of reserves will be decided by the competitive on an annual basis. Um, there is a competitive debt tender along the lines of similar strategic reserve schemes uh, on a on a paid as paid basis. Regarding now Italy, Italy is a rather complicated market, uh, a stressed market the past years uh, has to deal with decarbonization a lot, has to deal with other structural issues. Um, and hence, the Italian capacity market system is a little bit more uh, more complicated. Um, the, the Italians have actually introduced a capacity mechanism to ensure generation adequacy and, of course, security of supply. Uh, and that was obviously necessary because, um, um, because the, the, the existing structural changes in the Italian market were not enough to, um, to respond to the, to, to, to the sort of identified market failures. Um, there are reliability options that would be traded in central auctions managed by the TSO. Uh, the scheme uh, was also open to foreign capacity, a very, a very interesting element, uh, and the Commission really uh, uh, upload, uh, 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 upheld that in the sense that they were happy to hear that basically, um, uh, basically um, um, uh, stakeholders and, 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 and undertakings from other member states would actually participate, uh, which increases competition, in fact. Um, another element is that the, during the delivery period, contract capacity providers, providers do receive the premium. There is a payback obligation, uh, otherwise there are TSO sanctions. Uh, and one very important element regarding the duration of this, of this um, uh, mechanism in Italy is that there is no end date. Uh, it's viewed as a long-term measure, so it's a, 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 a rather sort of strategic approach of the Italians to, to make sure that capacity exists in the market and, and to when they need that, uh, they, 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 they have actually already declared to the Commission that they would re-notify the measure uh, with any changes introduced thereon. Um, obviously, you may, you, may, you, may, you may understand, and this is rather obvious, as I said, that there is a sort of broad affair between the European Commission um, and, 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 and the member states. Because on the one hand, member states want to secure capacity in their, in their domestic energy markets, and that's very challenging as we already saw. And on the other hand, the Commission wants to actually implement its very strict targets for, for, for massive decarbonization. So on the one hand, you may have a member state having to do blackouts because simply there is not enough capacity because, let's say, um, assuming that 
call or lignite plants have gone out of the market. And on the other hand, you've got the commission saying, no, no, no member state, you really have to stick to the strategy and you really have to move very fast with decarbonization. So um, uh, I would, I would, I would, from a legal perspective, I would actually, uh, I would actually, uh, you know, look at that as a debate between ensuring efficient competition in the market on the one hand, and on the other, uh, and on the other hand, uh, strengthening um, market market efficiency and market adequacy and and, and capacity adequacy. Um, uh, from a regulatory perspective, uh, of course, uh, if one were to look at the at the regulatory framework, obviously uh, there has been development. There have been developments in the past years. We started with the with the third energy package in two thousand nine. It has been transposed by most EU member states. Nevertheless, uh, there was no single mention to capacity mechanisms in the third energy package. Uh, five years later, in twenty fourteen, uh, we had the environmental and energy state aid guidelines. Was for the first time there were specific rules introduced to assess the compatibility of capacity mechanisms. And obviously, a year ago, 2019, uh, Articles 2027 20, of the Electricity Regulation um, do include uh, specific references to the uh, to capacity mechanisms. Um, let's say that if we look at the regulatory framework and will and we, if we look at the policy of the European Commission and the respective policies of the member states, um, we, we 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 could actually clarify and classify that debate as sort of the um, driven by the adequacy concerns and 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 market reforms are at the form at the forefront. So obviously there is a need to combine to combine those market reforms um, under the EU agenda with domestic uh, capacity mechanisms. Um, obviously um, it is of paramount importance for member states to show measures um, um, and and to implement measures that are absolutely necessary for the viability of their internal market. Um, you also got residual concerns, namely um, uh, certain problems that cannot be resolved solely on the basis of our reform. So there is a weakness there whereby um, market reforms that are pushed by the Commission are not really um, are not really enough to put it to put it that way. Um, another 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 important another important uh, thing that uh, has been going on for some time now is that um, um, resource adequacy um, concerns are important. The Commission recently launched an inquiry into the built-in capacity mechanism, um, and 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 this is this is important because there you see the state between the member states basically trying to implement a mechanism that would actually secure capacity in the market. While on the other hand, the Commission questioning the adequacy of the mechanism and questioning some side elements of that mechanism should it be renewed for the future. Of course, you've got the electricity regulation, which uh, introduces a rigorous adequacy assessment process, uh, and, and member states are um, required to uh, develop an implementation plan in this regard. And of course, most important thing is how do you address the root causes of the problem? So you need to have market reforms plus so market reforms plus anything required to basically um, deal with the root causes of the adequacy problems and plus a very rigorous timeline uh, during which these market reforms have to take place. Um, I think the commission's approach overall is that, well, listen, if we are convinced that despite the fact that you implemented market reforms and that you did what you had to do in terms of environmental objectives, you still do have adequacy concerns, well, in this regard, we're going to allow it. We're going to allow it through different regulatory measures. We're going to allow it through state aid measures. We're going to make sure you've got the you've got the capacity to serve the national market. So somehow uh, there is a there is some sort of leniency by the Commission, which only applies after the Commission explains that well, um, uh, we did, did this member state did whatever they had to do. Um, and then, and then, of course, from a regulatory perspective, the Commission has to issue an opinion within four months from the submission of the national implementation plan. Rusty, sorry to interrupt again, but uh, we're very close to the fifteen minutes. All right, so yeah, 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 obviously, yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's, it's it's absolutely okay. I, I guess, I guess, I guess. Uh, after mentioning this, this sort of um, um, four month window within which the Commission has to comment on the implementation plan, but that would come on to the conclusions of the paper, which basically is that. Um, Capacity me mechanisms are here to stay. Uh, it's not an instrument of the past. It's rather a a a a an ongoing an ongoing discussion that will be enhanced um, as we basically uh, as we basically also discuss the the broader energy transition. Um, 
Um, also, we, 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 we look at boosting the accelerated replacement of carbon intensive capacity uh, and, and, and adding together additional um, green requirements from member states. And it is there where, where capacity mechanisms especially in southeastern Europe uh, will start uh, and will continue playing a, a massive role in basically striking a compromise between uh, those, those diverging interests. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for this update. Uh, there was a lot of uh, really up-to-date information. Um, if uh, people want to ask questions, feel free, feel free to do that. Uh, only one question before we move forward uh, to the next presentation, from my side at least. Um, these capacity mechanisms, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that you focus on case studies, and I guess that uh, there, are, there is a lot of interest for Southeastern Europe. Um, is it, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, they have to be customized for the priorities of the EU. Uh, and my question is, for at the European level or at the country level, is it the EU-wide regulation or do you think that uh, it would be more optimal to do it, uh, to give incentives for a na national uh, regulation? To, well, that's, that, that, that's, 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 that's a very good question. I think that one way or another, we cannot avoid the EU regulation. Framework. Uh, right now, the EU regulatory framework provides for specific procedures, specific approval procedures uh, that all member states have to go through to implement uh, capacity mechanisms under the state aid rules of the, of the, of the European Union. Therefore, uh, that cannot be evaded. What can though be done, and that's a very good observation you're making, there is strengthening the domestic regulatory um, role. And, and this can be done by the Commission issuing guidelines or issuing directives that basically mm -hmm. would enhance the role of, uh, of local authorities, which indeed do have more experience in the particularities of the domestic energy markets and can actually um, mm -hmm. sort of proceed with implementing policy objectives of the European Union as well at the domestic level. Okay, excellent. Thank uh, you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the presentation. I think it uh, it's time we went to the to the next one, um, which is the, the the very timely one: the effects of COVID nineteen pandemic on the global energy markets and energy resilience. The example of head no uh, presenter Katerini Gika. I would be very interested to in this presentation. The stage is on to you. Uh, Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Catherine Giga and I am an electrical engineer in the Occupational Health and Safety Department of the Hellenic Distribution System Operator. Today I am here to present you our study about the impacts of the COVID pandemic on the global energy markets, focusing on the Greek uh, electricity sector. My talk will be divided into four parts. Firstly, we are going to see how the COVID crisis has affected the global energy systems as well as energy demand and investments. Next, we will specifically look at Greece that is considered as the most vulnerable among the advanced and emerging economies from the imposed shutdown. To this end, I will go on to highlight the operational challenges that the Hellenic DSO was faced with and the crisis preparedness and response actions adopted. Finally, we will identify evolving trends for the DSOs and in this context, the policy priorities of EDNO. So, to begin with, the coronavirus pandemic has caused the greatest global health and economic crisis of the 21st century. Minimizing the loss of life is the utmost priority, while the prevailing crisis has led bare stark weaknesses in the national healthcare systems bringing the most vulnerable parts of the population in the front. Beyond the swift health policy response, however, the world mostly requires decisive actions to mitigate the anticipated economic downturn, declines in investment and surge in unemployment. As demonstrated in Figure 1, according to the International Monetary Fund, the global activity is expected to trough in Q2 2020, recovering thereafter. In 2021, growth will strengthen and the annual global GDP is projected to just exceed the 2019 level. 
Apart from the major health and economic implications, the pandemic has severely affected the energy sector as populations across the world face lockdowns, limited travel and changing consumer behavior. First of all, the crisis has led to the biggest fall in energy demand in the recent 70 years. It's indicative that, according to the International Energy Agency, countries in full lockdown experienced an average 25% weekly decline in energy demand. This decline has been reflected in the record fall in global oil and electricity demand. Electricity demand drops have been more pronounced in economies with large service sectors that implemented strict measures such as Italy, where demand fell as shown in figure two by over 25% since entering lockdown. On the other hand, the energy mix has shifted in multiple markets towards renewables that have thus far proven to be the most resilient energy source to the COVID. Another important issue that has emerged during the crisis was related to the bans on disconnection, which have increased total costs for the DSOs. This has led to a decrease in revenues, deteriorating the DSO's cash flow and short-term liquidity. Last but not least, economic recession has forced energy companies and organizations globally to seize or decrease capex where possible. It's worth mentioning that according to the IEA, global energy investments are said to nosedive by 20% or about $400 billion compared to 2019. Let's now turn to the case of Greece. Unlike the positive outcome within the public health platform, the Greek fragile economy has emerged shaken from the pandemic. Major international and European organizations and institutes end up with a consensus that the national recession is likely to rival the worst years of the recent debt crisis. This given that Greece continues to hold Eurozone's highest ratio of public debt compared to its GDP. Following the COVID crisis, the national gross energy consumption is projected to decrease by approximately 11% in 2020. It's evident in the two figures on the left how the intensity of the lockdown effect is reflected in the electricity demand reduction. According to Hedno analysis, the monthly decrease in demand load compared to 2019 started from almost 4% in March, 15% in April, 13% in May, and escalated to almost 17% in June, mainly as a result of the paralyzed tourism activity. The evolution of total demand load in Attica follows a similar pattern. It's clear that increases in the residential demand have been by far outweighed by reductions in commercial and industrial applications. In this context, Hedno was burdened with a difficult task to deliver uninterrupted power to core services and households during the crisis. The main technical operation challenges that Hedno had to address were, first, the drop in the aggregated demand load that was mainly driven by the services sector. Second, the change in the daily load pattern that was different than normally expected. As illustrated in figure eight, the morning peak was arriving later in the day as a result of the confinement measures and telework regime. And third, the limited availability in workforce capacity, as most senior engineers with first-hand experience belong to the more vulnerable groups. Moving on to the financial operation challenges, the COVID crisis had a strong impact on head notes cash flow and short-term liquidity. Bans of disconnections have caused a considerable decrease in Hedno's revenues. What is more, the OPEX spend in the first semester of 2020 had to be increased for crisis management purposes. However, Hedno had sufficient working capital to finance its regular short-term liabilities and fund the most essential plant infrastructure investments. Overall, the Hellenic DSO has managed to adapt in a fast and efficient manner to the new operational regime through a series of preventive measures and crisis response actions. Well before the lockdown, a crisis management committee was formed and coordinated the development of a business continuity plan. Immediately after the announcement of restrictive measures, the most vulnerable groups have been drawn away 
while the security and safety of the SPAT centers stood out as the top priority. At the same time, a number of systems and applications, as shown in Figure 9, have been activated to facilitate the work from home policy and limit or even eliminate gatherings and business meetings. All staff with physical presence was provided with personal protective equipment on a weekly basis and frequent disinfections have been arranged to all buildings. As far as maintenance are concerned, the policy line was to restrict all field work to a minimum and plan interruptions of up to four hours for scheduled maintenance activities. After the lift of the lockdown and up to now, HEDNO follows a crisis management strategy that is based on the build of an internal crisis nerve center. As illustrated in Figure 11, on the top of the hierarchy stands the crisis management committee that assesses the effectiveness of all crisis management actions. A COVID team led by the Occupational Health and Safety Department's director is responsible for the crisis response coordination and planning actions. Focal points per region have been assigned to manage, coordinate and support the work of the COVID network that consists of key executives throughout all organizational departments. Members of this network are in charge of disseminating information and encouraging personnel's commitment to the internal COVID guidelines. On top of that, the crisis has highlighted the need for workforce upskilling and reskilling to ensure flexibility and adaptability to the new changing conditions. Last but not least, the organization, as an additional preventive and control measure, has initiated COVID-specific workplace inspections by the safety technicians. Now we come to the next point, which is the long-term emerging trends for the DSOs, and in this context, the policy priorities for HEDMO. In the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, we can recognize three emerging trends that will turn out to be extremely significant in the future. The first is the grid digitalization that will help grid managers to deal with reduced on-premise staff headcounts. The second is that due to the ongoing threat of major recession, there may be less funding available for the DSOs to invest in their grids. This could fundamentally alter utilities' traditional approach to investment, as budgets are likely to emphasize on sweating assets and exclude non-essential capital-intensive investments. And the third is the focus on microgrid and energy technologies, as well as electromobility as a result of the generated consumer need for self-sufficiency. Taken together, these changes set new priorities for, for HEDNO, including large-scale integration of renewables, investment in innovative technologies, promotion of energy efficiency, penetration of electromobility, and reinforcement of the safety and security culture. Such policy priorities will act as accelerators for HEDNO's holistic transformation towards the much needed energy transition. In conclusion, the shock that the global energy market is experiencing as a result of the COVID pandemic can bring to the surface critical issues that need to be addressed for the transition to sustainable energy. The leading role for this transition clearly belongs to the DSOs, which are called now, more than ever, to get prepared for similar future asymmetric threats by enhancing the electric grid resilience and strengthening safety and security culture. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, for the presentation. That was very interesting. Um, one question from uh, my side. I, I appreciate that uh, your work is uh, maybe a case study of uh, Edno, but uh, you did mention in your presentation that um, you see the, the investment of the utilities changing their investment style or the focus. So I guess you meant in a qualitative manner. So can you elaborate a bit on that? What do you think would be the new uh, direction, obviously safety and security, but uh, how do you see the uh, constrained cash flows affecting future investments? Um, of course, uh, with the aim of uh, ensuring energy resilience of the systems, 
uh, the focus should be on uh, renewable technologies that uh, prove to be the most resilient energy source uh, during the crisis. Uh, electromobility, because the public tran uh, transport means um, uh, weren't uh, used so far during the, the shutdown. And uh, of course, uh, investment should be done uh, in the field of security of the companies so that they will be ready to face such crises in the future. For example, uh, to be more uh, prepared for cyber attacks during the telework regime or uh, to be able to uh, make business continuity plans to, to be ready to, to face such threats in the future. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And thank you for keeping in time. Uh, we are exactly right on time. So I believe that we can uh, move uh, a bit more relaxed on the next presentation. Uh, energy transition projections of the Serbian energy sector and lessons learned for decarbonization in the Balkans. Uh, very timely topic too. Uh, Ioannis Stefanu is the next presenter. Shall I pass the stage on to you? Okay, ah, so I was I'm with somebody else. <laughs> I have a replacement for Yanis because he was he couldn't couldn't assist. So my name is Nenad Jovanovic. Welcome. So and I will present you this presentation. Just to turn it on so I can see it. Can everybody see in the presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. So thank you for the floor. As I mentioned, I'm Nenad Jovanovic. I work as an energy consultant in the LDK consultants. Uh, I will be presenting the energy transition projections of uh, Serbian energy sector and the lessons learned from decarbonization in the Balkans. Uh, the first part of the pre presentation is based on our uh, project that we did in uh, Serbia, which was the energy uh, planning development and the energy strategy for the Serb Serbian government, where all the stakeholders were, were involved. And the lessons learned for decarbonization is based on our experience that we did in the Western Balkan countries. Just in brief, for those who don't know, uh, LDK Consultants is a company based in Greece, but we also operate in, in many other countries in, in Europe and in uh, Africa. Uh, we are a partner of uh, international funds, investors, policy makers, and we provide uh, specialist advices and consulting services. We exist more than uh, 50 years and we have more than 100 employees. Uh, here are just some list of, of um, project that we did for international um, uh, um, funds. Um, we did work in Albania and Serbia, uh, also Moldova and Georgia, which are uh, a bit further from the Balkans. And we also had some minor projects in, uh, in Bosnia and, and um, also Kosovo and, and, and <clears throat> North Macedonia. Just a brief uh, overview of the Balkan and Serbian sectors. Uh, as most of you know, the Western Balkans are, have all signed the Energy Community Treaty, and they are in the process of reforming of the energy sector towards energy and, and the climate policies that already exist in the European Union. Um, um, the energy community have uh, set some targets for uh, renewable energies, uh, for uh, energy efficiency, and for the CO2 emissions. Unfortunately, what we have seen from the reports of the energy community is that not a lot of um, countries have managed to assess those goals and those targets. And uh, as you can see uh, in the left-hand side of, of this slide here, we, I present the installed electricity generation capacities um, in the whole uh, Western Balkan six, six countries. You can see that most of the installed capacity comes from coal fried uh, generation uh, or plants. Then uh, we go to the hydro, which is around 44%, and just a minor part are the renewables. However, the, the, the positive thing is that the, the increasement of renewable energy is significant, especially from the year 2017 until 2018, uh, with a rise of 43%. Um, 
Serbia doesn't deviate much from the other countries in the Balkan region. It's uh, a country with a high dependency on lignin-based electricity production. And this is not uh, on, done on accident because Serbia is the third largest lignite resource in Europe. And uh, in 2018, the two thirds of electricity generation came from, from uh, lignite-based plants. Uh, then another third comes from mainly from hydro, around 30% and 2.4% from the wind power. Uh, this is of course a major challenge uh, for the country to tackle and to prepare for the coal phase out that should come in the near future. Uh, and um, it's true that Serbia puts a lot of effort in the integration of renewables. However, based on the current energy strategy, uh, the coal will still remain the, the main uh, source of generation in the near future. Uh, there is an ongoing development of uh, fossil fuel generation plant, which is in the capacity of 350 uh, megawatts, and uh, the, the terminal mine which should support this um, new plant is has already expanded its production. In order to overcome these uh, these challenges, uh, the, we were engaged in in the uh, project financed by the Europaid, and what we have done is to support Serbia in reforming the energy policy. Uh, we have implemented and designed the software tool uh, based on the TIMES model, and it is used for energy policy analysis. Um, just briefly about the TIMES model, it's a very detailed bottom-up model uh, where you can include uh, all the individual plants that are existing and that are planned in the near future. Um, by the way, the modeling was done uh, uh, for the horizon up to 2025 with the projections up to 30, but I'm going to present the projections up to 2050, just to see all the, all the trajectories going towards the carbonization uh, pathway. Uh, the model also has all the demand sector included, of course, renewable energy, and there are 20, 24 time slices where we include four, se uh, four seasons in the year and six daily periods in order to accommodate the demand and to show uh, a proper uh, renewable energy generation. So talk talking about the policy scenarios, we have created four main scenarios going from the reference up to the decarbonization scenario. The reference scenario we have is what we call business as usual, where we don't have the ETS system. Uh, the energy improvement is uh, uh, not that very advanced. And we have really low renewable potential, whereas when we go down to the decarbonization scenario, we have uh, ETS uh, scheme implemented. We have high renewable potential. We have uh, implemented um, high energy efficiency, and we have also uh, the CO2 taxes. Um, now the results of, of the modeling and, uh, and this uh, proposed scenarios show really interesting results. In this uh, graph, first I'm gonna show uh, the generation mix per each of the scenario. In the left-hand side, you can see the reference scenario where uh, it is important to highlight that lignite uh, even increases up to 2050 for 12%. Uh, the rise of the installed capacity is limited and doesn't grow uh, much uh, more than 10 gigawatts. Whereas when you include policy scenarios, uh, you see that uh, the lignite-based generation uh, declines a lot, especially in the years uh, 45 and 50. And you have a rise, a huge rise of the uh, renewables uh, due to policy that is uh, included. Uh, so, um, talking about the renewables in the gross final energy consumption, I would like to highlight uh, the energy community targets that are set for Serbia and the projections that we got. So, uh, these uh, dots here, green dots, uh, show the targets of the energy community for Serbia, which say that Serbia should have 27% of uh, renewables in the gross final consumption up to 2020 and 35.6% in 2030. Uh, unfortunately, none of our scenarios, even the, the, the conversation which is showed 
in this uh, light blue line um, cannot achieve uh, these targets. This just shows that these targets uh, are not cost effective and that they have been overestimated. Uh, this is not a negative thing because th th there is no uh, uh, need to force that we have high renewable uh, percentages if we can achieve the goal of reducing the emissions, which is, of course, our final goal of decarbonization. And this can be achieved by uh, reaching a really high energy efficiency by switching to uh, different fuels and by uh, having a high res share in the final consumption. Uh, talking about the energy efficiency, uh, this can be achieved with a really deep decarbonization strategy, which means that we need to have um, uh, high ETS prices, uh, high energy efficiency achievement, and high penetration of renewable energy. In the graph presented in, in this slide, uh, we can see the um, the uh, lines, not the lines presented as a target of the energy community for the final energy consumption. Um, these uh, bars present each of the scenarios going from decarbonization onto the uh, reference scenario. And we can see that the decarbonization scenario in 2030 is the only one who can cope with this uh, um, targets, whereas that the reference scenario uh, cannot fulfill the targets. Uh, this brings us to the energy, uh, to the greenhouse gas emissions. And the presented slide, you can see a figure uh, with the CO2 emissions per sector. Um, from the left-hand side and to right-hand side, we go from the reference to the decarbonization scenario. Uh, you can see that uh, yellow bar represents the electricity production, the green one is the industry, and the blue one is the transport. At the beginning, of course, the electricity is the one who emits the most. Um, at the end uh, of the reference scenario in 2050, these emissions even increase from for up to 90% 90, 90 if we take the reference a year of 2016. However, if we do implement um, policy scenarios and taking into account that we have uh, to achieve the same GDP, GDP growth, we can achieve a significant reduction in CO2 emissions uh, going almost to zero if we go to the carbonation scenario where we only have industry and the transportation as uh, one of the two main sector drivers. Uh, of course, the electricity sector will be the lead, uh, leader towards the decarbonization, and uh, Serbia has a considerable potential in decarbonization once the ETS prices are included, with, because this will increase the costs of electricity generation for the traditional coal-based uh, plants. Uh, the share of uh, electricity sector will reduce a lot, going from uh, 43 percent in 2016. Uh, down to 1% or 7% for the uh, mentioned policy scenarios. In uh, year 2030, as we have made this planning, we will have a reduction of 20 to uh, almost 30%. And uh, now I, I, will, I will go to some lessons learned uh, instead of uh, some conclusions. So there is a possibility. The positive thing is that there is a possibility for the smooth transition uh, uh, in uh, Serbia without uh, added cost. The main challenges for energy decision uh, in its uh, decarbonization uh, pathway is the uh, transformation of uh, generation mix where we need to have more renewables. Uh, we need to invest, uh, we need to uh, find a way to attract investments. And of course, the incumbent producer needs to become more efficient. There are uh, a lot of subsidies in the power sector that drive low prices, which disregard the state of the uh, energy poverty. Um, local municipalities, uh, they need to strive you know, towards the uh, economy diversification. Um, alone in Serbia, we have more than 50,000 people and, and municipalities that uh, work in the uh, coal-based industry. And in order to support the decarbonization and uh, coal phase-out uh, perspective, 
um, high valuable investments needs to be made in the sector. The outlook is positive, as shown, there is a, a lot of potential for decarbonization once the ETS and CO2 prices schemes are slowly in, included in the, in the sector. Renewable energy will play a major role and uh, more focus uh, towards 2050 should be put on the demand side uh, in order to uh, further reduce the level of the final energy consumption. Um, of course, the, another factor is to uh, increase electricity interconnection, but also the natural gas pipelines in the region, which will improve uh, the overall energy security. And the main message uh, from what we have seen of our experience in the region is that the total cost of not implementing the energy transition strategy is marginally higher than the decarbonization strategy, which means better to do uh, some improvements as soon as possible, then wait for the business as usual strategy. So based on our experience in the uh, projects performed in the Balkans and our experience in Greece since the elder cases yeah. been in Greece, yes? Uh, sorry, uh, um, you are, we are very close to the 15 minutes, so if you can... Um, yes, yes, I'm working up. Within a couple of minutes, that would be excellent. Yes, I'm working up. This is the last slide. Excellent. Uh, so the, the lessons learned from the Balkans is um, that uh, there is a need to set feasible realistic targets for renewable increase, for energy efficiency improvement and greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, unfortunately, there is a lack of foreign investment attraction and uh, there are moder moderate financial support uh, in uh, different schemes uh, like feed-in tariffs to increase renewables. For example, in Serbia, currently we don't have an active uh, support scheme in, in year 2020. Um, the, the lack of foreign investments also come from inefficient uh, price signal because the state of the market liberalization needs to be improved. Also, the incumbent producers are heavily subsidized, which force the prices to be really low and uh, not realistic. Uh, for example, all eight, eight, eight incumbent producers uh, hold 93% of all the Western Balkan 6 electricity production, which also will drive the energy poverty as uh, we gradually remove uh, the state subsidies and uh, the inclusion of CO2 taxes will, of course, uh, significantly impact the, the energy prices. Uh, in this case, all parties need to be involved, not only at the national level, but also internationally. Uh, the regional aspect here is uh, really crucial because it provides a better opportunity towards transition. Uh, policies, projects need to be uh, developed on the regional level so you know what the, we know what the uh, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood is doing, such as uh, the uh, trans banking corridor, which will assure better cross uh, border balancing, high renewable integration, and final market coupling. And the final uh, message is that the investment should go towards the demand side uh, as it is more cost efficient and there is a big opportunity in energy efficiency improvement. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for being on time. Uh, one quick question, uh, and I would like you if you, if you could uh, respond uh, a bit briefly. Um, at some point, you saw in the presentation that um, the, um, even in the most uh, optimistic scenario, uh, said they cannot meet the targets. Is that uh, because their targets are optimistic or because uh, the, the planning was inadequate? Or what do you think this is the case? I understand okay. that you suggested many things that could be done, but uh, why even in the optimistic scenario we are below the Yes, even, even in the optimistic scenario, the, the targets are not achievable because they are just too optimistic. They are not cost effective uh, because if you put okay. all the, the information in the model, you just get that it's too expensive. It's not economically viable to do it. Uh, however, with the same amount of funds, you can go towards the mine side to improve the energy efficiency part. It's not that needed to uh, strictly force the... Um, share of renewables in the mix when you can go more to, towards the energy efficiency side to the mm -hmm. demand side to reduce the final consumption and to achieve even better results with uh, less funds with less investments uh, to achieve the same results for the 
uh, reduction of the CO2 emissions and, and greenhouse gases, which is our optimal goal in, in decarbonization. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think for the sake of time, uh, we can move to the next presentation, which is uh, uh, I will be the presenter. Uh, let me go to my presentation. I think I, I do share my screen. Um, so, um, then in other presenters before him, they uh, mentioned that um, uh, focusing on uh, making CO2 emissions uh, more expensive, it will actually lead to a better equilibrium. And uh, let me take you, let me take this pass and move forward to the actual market, the EU ETS. Um, the EU ETS is uh, has created a new asset, which is the the CO2 the emissions. And because it is an asset, uh, it has a price. And when it has a price, we can focus and uh, focus on it and investigate how this price. Uh, does evolve, what affects the pricing and uh, wh whether it actually reflects what it should reflect, even if it is policy oriented, uh, whether it reflects the fundamentals. That's a major idea that I would like to investigate. Uh, the, the presentation, the, the focus the, uh, here is slightly different from the previous presentations uh, and it is uh, a bit technical. One of the major contributions here is uh, price modeling. Uh, I will try to spare you the equations, but eventually I will have to show some. Uh, at least I will try to uh, navigate you through the, uh, the models, the, some specific part of the models to highlight what, uh, what is done. Now, CO2 has a price, and this price is affected, it, it, it is traded in a market. And because it is traded in a market as all assets, uh, it is affected by two things. One is public information. When there is regulation changes, when there is uh, public announcements, shifts in macroeconomic uh, variables and data, that it is expected, should be expected to affect the price of carbon. Uh, on the other side, uh, there is some trading, trading history. There is uh, uh, agents in the market. They interact with each other and they resolve their private information, whatever that private information might be. That, that the implication of that is that there is learning in the market. We observe data, we make some judgment, and we act on it. And therefore, prices might change because there is new information, public information, or it might change because uh, there is some information revealed through trading. Now, uh, usually when we uh, focus on uh, what kind of information we can extract from the market, the usual suspects, the usual variables are how much volume, how much liquidity there is in the market, either frequency of trading, how many transactions per unit of time, or how much is the volume uh, of the trading uh, per unit of time. Previous studies with respect to the trading, tra trade by trade, so the focus here is microstructure. It is uh, not weekly observations or monthly observations, it's how the prices evolve in real time. When the market opens in the morning and closes in the afternoon, there is, uh, uh, th th uh, prices move and they move either because of the arrival of information or because of liquidity changes that uh, market participants observe and they act on it. Previous studies have shown that uh, there is a big distinction in the levels of liquidity. One is the overall liquidity. How much, uh, what is the total volume of trading in a period of time? That has been shown by previous studies that it does help actually uh, the market to become more efficient. It does help pricing uh, in a sense that uh, if you want to exchange an asset, you do not face a liquidity premium. However, there is another kind of liquidity, especially uh, investigated in the carbon market, which is the what is called relative liquidity. Uh, you have you start, for example, with a quiet morning, and at some point you see that the, for a minute or two there is a lot of trading. Uh, so it is higher compared to something else. That's why it's called relative. You might infer that. This increased trading, especially if it is in, towards one direction, increasing the price or decreasing the price, might be because there is new information. So this higher relative volatility actually introduces uncertainty that has to be resolved. Now, um, the overall idea in the literature is that the EU ETS becomes more efficient in a sense that it better reflects the fundamentals. But it, uh, if you under, if you uh, focus on the concept of relative liquidity, that might mean that uh, there might be more information that has to be resolved. 
what is the question here? Uh, uh, in this paper, I in re uh, uh, visit the idea of whether the pricing on an intraday scale uh, it is efficient. And it does matter whether it is efficient because an efficient pricing reflects the fundamentals. If there is a new regulation, uh, either anticipated or announced, the prices should reflect that. But if the prices are affected by very low liquidity and there is a liquidity premium, then they do not reflect the fundamentals. Or if the market is too sensitive to fluctuations in liquidity, that is interpreted as information, uh, then again, the prices deviate from um, uh, the fundamentals. In both cases, in both cases, the EU ETS fails to, to, to meet its uh, objective, which is actually to reflect prices in a way that gives incentives for further investments in renewables or other sources that, or decarbonization. So the, the question here is, do the prices we see, do the price discovery, the intraday price discovery we see in the market really uh, reflect the fundamentals or is it affected by other frictions as we call them? For doing so, and apologies here for uh, uh, the equations that you see, it's quite uh, overloading, but I will try to navigate you. If the market is efficient and frictionless, the price, this PI over here, reflects the efficient price. And the efficient price, the change in price, it is a random walk. This is the symbol of the random walk. So if there is, uh, if the market is frictionless and super efficient, then uh, the price you see in the market reflects the efficient price and the changes in the price is simply a random walk. You cannot forecast it. However, uh, because especially the EUTS is a hybrid market and uh, there are uh, designated market makers, they provide immediacy and there is a cost for that. This cost usually, uh, it takes the symbol of phi and it is uh, estimated like that. This phi over here is the cost of liquidity that comes from uh, the bid ask spread QI is whether it is a buy or a sell. And what we call price discreteness. Uh, the, the fundamental price might be 99.999999, but the tick of the price is only one uh, cent. Now, the liquidity is a friction. Liquidity costs that come, they are considered to be immediacy costs, they are frictions. So if the, these frictions are very high, the prices are less efficient. They do not fully reflect what is uh, the fundamental value. Also, because there are designated market makers, uh, they might face a better informed agent. And in that case, if they trade with that agent, uh, they will lose. In order to protect themselves, they charge a spread. This theta over here is how much they think uh, they need as a compensation for what this MI over here, what they think the presence of uh, non price resolved information exists. So it, the interest, the parameters of interest is this theta over here, which reflects information, and this phi over here that reflects uh, um, liquidity, liquidity frictions. If theta and phi are high, that means that this public information component, this epsilon, is low. And we measure um, efficiency. The, uh, the variable of interest is the one over here. It is the variance of public information, how much of the price changes, of the variance of price changes, um, depends on, uh, sorry, how much of the total variance of price changes uh, is driven by the variance of public information. In a frictionless, if there are no frictions and the market is efficient, uh, this ratio goes to one. The higher it is, the more efficient the market. The lower it is, the less efficient the market. Now, the first contribution uh, I will start with the equations uh, is that in the previous literature, this the variance of uh, this epsilon, the public information, and the variance of that they are static. Uh, in that paper. I suggest an autoregressive version of them. So all the parts of uh, the variance of the conditional variance become uh, time variant. I will not show the equations uh, per se. You can see the paper for them. But the idea, what I would like to show is, uh, I will jump to the findings. What do you see over here? This line that starts from about 60%, 55%, and drops down to 38% is this ratio over here plotted is the, the, all the data fro, from uh, the EU ETS up to uh, the end of uh, 2016. And uh, 
uh, I estimate what is the proportion of total variance attributed to public information. And as you can see, that drops. And that drops significantly. It stabilizes in around 2012, but it drops significantly uh, from uh, uh, the exception of phase two uh, uh, onwards. That is interpreted as low, lower efficiency. The market, the prices themselves, they are driven less and less by public information. Instead, what do you see here? The red line is uh, the information part of the variance. This is the liquidity part of the variance. And this is the interaction between these two frictions. And all of them, they do increase. Their proportion increases significantly um, over the years. What is, what, what is that supposed to mean? Prices on an intraday level, they are driven more by trading and less by public information. They, that, that means that the price becomes less efficient. That is exactly um, the opposite of what the literature reports. The total variance, that is the actual variance you observe in the market, decreases. This is the volume and this is the, the duration. How, how long do you need to wait for a trade to happen? You have uh, more frequent trading and you have, we have in the EU ETS more uh, higher volume per trade. That means that the overall trading intensity is a lot higher. And that leads, that overall liquidity leads to a lower variance per trade. This is what the previous literature reports. They say that since there is lower variance, that means that there is lower information per trade. That is more efficient. The market is more efficient. But what we actually report is that although there is lower information allocated per trade to be resolved, that is resolved in a worse way because that information does not participate a lot in the pricing. It is the frictions that participate in the pricing. So the, let's say, per day pricing might be OK, might be more efficient, but the trade per day price, the trade per trade pricing is not, uh, it's actually becoming less efficient. And that is uh, the take home uh, information from that paper. We, okay, I will not focus too much on the empirical contribution and the modeling contribution. We make the uh, uh, estimates of the public information and price discreteness variance to be time varying. But the focus is on the empirical uh, findings. We find that although that the liquidity increases significantly over the years, more and more trading, and that helps uh, pricing in aggregated terms, the way that the pricing occurs on a trade-by-trade -trade basis uh, is worse. And therefore, the implications of our work, of the work here, is that uh, the new regulations should focus on transparency and liquidity. Uh, the, the more um, information is disseminated in the market, the better is going to be the pricing on an intraday level. Uh, and I stop here. I think I'm right about time to do so. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, I would I would be happy to answer them. So. Okay, I don't see any. Thanks for attending. And I think it's uh, high time we went to the next presentation. We have still uh, time to do that. The next presentation will be uh, the viability of a Mediterranean energy hub and the interests of uh, European Union and Russia, common or conflicted, by Antonio Stratakis. Um, Good evening. Hello, hello, uh, welcome. Uh, Stage last but not least. <laughs> Excellent, welcome. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think that you all see my presentation. Okay, uh, so what we're about to, uh, to discuss today. Uh, first of all, I have to say that my uh, presentation is not an econometrical one, like those that I have uh, already heard, but uh, it's uh, more something like a geopolitical one. So uh, what exactly we're going to see right now we are going to investigate what are the interests, the energy interests of European Union and, of course, 
Russia, and then we will discuss and we will see if they are common or conflicted. In other words, on what extent does European Union needs Russian energy? So, uh, here we have to say that uh, Russia's energy policy is aiming, okay, uh, to raise its European market share and also to raise its global influence in terms of energy flows. What exactly do we mean by this? Uh, of course, as you all know, in the last decade, we have an energy hub in Southeast Mediterranean. Uh, we will see in the years to come its role and the inevitable fierce competition that it will face by other well-established or emerging gas producing areas such as Australia, I have heard about it yesterday, or uh, Mozambique, or even USA. Uh, so let's see something about Southeast European, uh, Southeast Mediterranean, sorry, uh, so far proven gas reserves. The total quality is ranging, the total quantity, sorry, it's, is ranging between 2.17 trillion cubic meters and 2.85 trillion cubic meters. So the question is, is this quantity sufficient enough uh, to supply European Union energy needs on a steady basis or not? And the above quantity of about 2.75 trillion cubic meters uh, stems for, from uh, the aforementioned from the so far proven gas fields in uh, Southeast Mediterranean region. So, uh, and of course, we have to examine up to what extent European Union is really willing to become independent from Russian energy flows. Uh, in the meantime, as we all know, we have the COVID-19 consequences in the global energy sector, where uh, we have highly vulnerable uh, crude oil prices. And uh, of course, despite the fact that the drilling technology is constantly being updated in a cost-saving di direction, uh, as I have already heard, there is no drilling activity at the moment. So uh, the main energy question is, is the East Mediterranean important and for, and for whom? Uh, as we all know and as we can, as we can guess, uh, European Union is mainly an energy consumer. Okay, that means that actually European Union consumes uh, a much more, much more quantity levels that it, it actually produces. Uh, for example, we can see here that European Union, and according to the BP Annual Energy Report, European Union energy production levels in 2019 stood at 286 million tons of oil equivalent, while its energy consumption levels reached 1. 1,633 million tons of oil equivalent, 12% of global market share. That actually means that uh, European energy needs outpace production levels by almost five times. Okay, so uh, in this table, if, you, if uh, we see uh, the changes in the decade period between 2009 and 2019, we can see that uh, European Union consumption levels have declined by 4.1%. We can see that oil consumption is down by 9.7%. Coal, coal consumption is down by 13.4%. Natural gas that we are discussing right now is down by 3.1%. And the most important thing that I would like to highlight here is that renewables consumption has risen by 205% in the decade. So as we can see here, there is a positive trend towards renewable energy, okay, as it refers to power generation and other Greek energy projects. In this uh, diagram, we can see the European Union's gas consumption level because we would like to focus on gas consumption and the, and the viability and the feasibility of the so-called uh, East Mediterranean Energy Hub. Uh, so we can see that European Union gas consumption levels in the decade between 2009 and 2019, if I can say so, since 2014, are on a modest rise. Uh, so 
uh, from where actually European Union imports uh, its gas. Uh, European Union imports its gas, as, as we can see here, mainly, mainly from its eastern borders. I mean, from countries like Russia, Azerbaijan, and others, in order to cover, in order to cover uh, its gas energy deficit. What does this actually mean? Uh, this means that Eurasia, as you can see here, holds 32% of world proven gas reserves. It is 64 trillion cubic meters. While European Union uh, total proved the reserves, we exclude the, the ones in the uh, Southeast Mediterranean, are 700 billion cubic meters. So, uh, let's see here. So, uh, European Union natural gas trade movements are uh, totaling 751 billion cubic meters in 2019 of which 80% of the above natural gas trade took place by pipelines, while only 20% actually took place via LNG vessels. As it refers to natural gas imports via pipelines, European Union imports mainly from Russia and Norway. Russia accounts for 40% for of natural gas imports via pipelines. As it refers to LNG imports, we mean via vessels, we can see that Qatar is on the first place, which supplied 32 billion cubic meters in Europe in 2019. And Russia is on the second place, uh, which exported 21 billion cubic meters in Europe in 2019. That actually means that uh, Russian total gas flows to Europe stand at almost 210 billion cubic meters annually, while European natural gas imports in general stand at uh, almost 600 billion cubic meters. That actually means that Russian annual gas flows to Europe hold a 35% market share. So the question is, can this 35% market share be replaced and up to what extent based on the uh, natural gas reserves in in southeast mediterranean uh, now let's go to the russian energy sector uh, russia is mainly a producer as we can see here and not a consumer uh, russia is the second largest gas producer worldwide following united states uh, and of course in 2019 russia had a natural gas surplus of 235 billion cubic meters ready to be exported. So, uh, if we can see, as we can see here, uh, Russia exports mainly to Europe via pipelines, we, we can see here, with 188 billion cubic meters, and uh, market share in Russian pipeline exports of 86.5%, and Russia mainly exports to Germany, to Italy, and of course, to Turkey. Also, we have the Russian LNG exports, which, uh, which are mainly headed, which are also mainly, mainly headed to Europe with 21 million cubic meters, a 43% of uh, market share of Russian LNG exports is headed to Europe also. And here we have countries like France, Spain, and others. Uh, and of course, uh, as uh, you will probably know, Russia is also heavily engaged in the Asia Pacific region where it exported 18 billion cubic meters of LNG, mainly to Japan, China and South Korea. So, as we can see from this map, which actually illustrates all the active uh, Russian gas pipelines to Europe, we can see that Russia's geopolitical concept is actually to encircle Europe with natural gas pipeline networks. Here we have the existing Russian gas pipeline network to Europe, which is consisted of Nord Stream Pipeline, Jamal Europe Pipeline, Blue Stream Pipeline, and Urengoy Uzgorod Pipeline, which actually Russia is seeking uh, to disengage because uh, Russia wants to export its natural gas through Turkey. For that reason, Russia is promoting 
Turkstream pipeline, which is actually operational since January 2020. And of course, uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, which is quite a hot topic, if we can say so, uh, th these days. Uh, and so far, it seems that Russia finds willing energy partners in Turkey and also Germany. And that, in my opinion, actually jeopardizes uh, the possible uh, viability and uh, feasibility of the Southeast Mediterranean gas reserves. Uh, if we want uh, to talk about uh, quantities, uh, we come to the conclusion that so far proven gas reserves supply and service the supply of the involved countries, Egypt, Israel, and also Cyprus in the medium term, uh, in terms of securing their energy independence, meeting their low level domestic needs and consumption. If we consider that the so far global proved gas reserves stand at 198.8 trillion cubic meters, we can see that the Southeast Mediterranean region gas reserves of about 2.5 trillion CBM holds a rather limited market share of only 1%. As a result, the aforementioned gas reserves in, in Southeast Mediterranean are actually dwarfed by those in Russia, I Iran, or even Qatar. So the above gas discoveries do not reveal a sufficient amount of reserves capable of ensuring a steady gas supply to Europe on a permanent and exclusive basis. If we take into account the uh, aforementioned European Union's gas consumption levels, which were 470 billion cubic meters in 2019, the Southeast Mediterranean gas reserves could exclusively cover European gas needs for only 4.6 years. If we also take into account the, the Russian gas flows to Europe, which are, as we have already mentioned, 209 billion cubic meters, the so far proved Southeast Mediterranean gas reserves could replay Russian gas flows to Europe for only nine to 10 years. So, simply put, the Eastern Mediterranean has so far a limited strategic role to play in terms of European energy independence. And of course, Germany is by far the biggest natural gas consumer in European Union. And for the moment, it seems unlikely to stop depending on the long-term supply of Russian natural gas, especially after the, 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 forth, the forthcoming fulfillment of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, I don't know how much time do, do I have. Uh, we are about... I, uh, have uh, sorry, Antonis, we are about to finish off. So if you can conclude, that would be excellent. Okay. One or two me, minutes, that would be excellent. Okay, thank you. But uh, I have to say that in this region, we, we have X factors and black swans. The X factor, of course, is Turkey. Okay, Turkey, we all know that, uh, is constantly updating into a local energy hub, into the biggest energy hub in Southeast Mediterranean. Uh, but in my opinion, in my opinion, we have a black swan. And the actually black swan is uh, that according to a report that has been made by Professor Konofagos in 2018, the report says that there is an average possibility of 50% for the Greek territory to contain huge hydrocarbon reserves of about 3.1 trillion cubic meters. If we, consider the, if we consider that amount, that quantity, we can see that uh, over 2 trillion cubic meters are actually located in the area between southern Crete and, of course, the Herodotus Basin. As we can see here, the Herodotus Basin is that area. That area contains over 2 trillion cubic meters, which actually equals uh, to the amount that has already found in other uh, Southeast Mediterranean gas deposits. So in my opinion, 
uh, this is the main reason why actually Turkey has maritime disputes in the area. Uh, just to remind you, uh, the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding with uh, Libya and the proclamation of a unified exclusive economic zone between Turkey and Libya. Uh, and this is actually the maritime region that Turkey claims. And Turkey claims that region because, in my opinion, knows and understands that in Herodotus Basin, somewhere here, there are tremendous gas deposits. So thank you very much. And I am glad to hear. Excellent. Any. Thank you. Thank you for finishing off on time. Unfortunately, we are already a bit uh, late, so okay. I have to finish the session here. It was an excellent topic, very timely, I would say. Uh, thanks for this uh, updated info with respect to the reserves. Um, thank you all for uh, attending this session. I hope that you found it interesting. Um, I, uh, we, we are about to, to finish off. Uh, there will be a video playing and then uh, the, the floor will be on the next session. Thanks for attending. Thanks, everybody, for being on time uh, with the presentations. Um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of uh, the conference. Goodbye from... Uh